At this point in the franchise, Five Nights at Freddy's could possibly be split into two distinct timelines. Essentially, FNAF 1 to Ultimate Custom Night, and then Help Wanted moving onward. Mainly because Help Wanted establishes that it's possible that the earlier FNAF games are made by an indie dev in-universe. So if we can solve what that first set of games is trying to say, then either we solve the timeline up to Ultimate Custom Night, or we solve what Fazbear Entertainment is trying to tell the public in the new timeline. Either way, I think it's a win-win. So, for the next four videos, like I announced last week, we are going to be doing our best to create a definitive FNAF timeline from FNAF 1 all the way to Ultimate Custom Night using only information found in the games. So slices, put on your aprons, this is gonna be a big one. To start, I wanna try to comb through every single piece of lore we can pull from the games and the Scott Games website. So we're going to start with FNAF 1, moving probably to FNAF 4, and we'll see how far we can get by combing through these games and pulling out everything we can find. We could go in the order of the timeline chronology, but we aren't sure what the timeline is yet. So we'll go in order of release, starting with FNAF 1. Do you wanna go down? Already? Is that better? Are you a baby? Ow, not a baby. Not a baby. I release you. As far as lore goes, the things FNAF 1 brings to the table is pretty sparse. To be fair, I don't think Scott expected this to be a 10 plus year franchise when he released this game, so he just gave us a few details to kind of chew on a mystery while we played. But there is still lore here to get, so we'll start with the most direct lore we can find, written down lore. The game opens with the classic Help Wanted advert, which is pretty devoid of useful information. It more so just specifies exactly what's going on for the player's sake. At the end, we get a paycheck of 100 $20.50 from Fazbear Entertainment to a Mike Schmidt on November 13th, XX. This could be very important, so put a pin in that paycheck for now. Actually, let's do one better. The paycheck is dated November 13th, and typically in the States, payday is Friday and your checks are dated as such. So we can use the idea that since November 13th is on a Friday, we can try to figure out what year that was, or at least get a range of possible years it could be. I'll explain later when we go into the evidence, but just letting you know now, the range is going to be from the 70s to 2023, for reasons we'll explain. So using this paycheck and calendars of the last few decades, we can deduce that FNAF 1 likely took place in one of the following years. 1970, 1981, 1987, oh god, we'll get into that one, 1992, 1998, 2009, 2015, or 2020. Okay, so again, pin in that for now, let's move on. We get a pink slip to get fired at the end of Custom Night, with a reason that reads, tampering with the animatronics, general unprofessionalism, odor. So we'll put a pin in that, that could be important. Now onto the real meat of the lore from paper in this game. Occasionally throughout the night when this poster is looked at on the cameras, it can sometimes turn into a newspaper article describing events that took place at a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The four articles that can occur have some key details, and you can read them in full if you'd like, but in the interest of time, the takeaways for the lore here are that five children went missing at a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, later on the animatronic mascots started to reek like dead bodies. And something really important that I brought up in my last video that I didn't hear a lot of people talk about recently, the murderer is found and arrested. Look closely. The suspect has been charged. In the article titled, Five Children Now Reported Missing, Suspect Convicted. This would have radical implications for the timeline if William is in jail, or at least someone took the fall for him. But again, we don't know who William or Henry is yet in this franchise, so for now, we'll just mark that whoever did the missing child incident either went to jail or someone went to jail for them. Also, for the record, it mentions in the article that the restaurant then closes down with the hopes of being opened again. Up next for the lore is the Phone Guy dialogues. Every night starts with a pre-recorded message from, well, Phone Guy. We don't have his real name. And according to him, he's the last guy that took the position before we slot in that Monday. These are pretty long and typically are mostly filled with game mechanics, but there is some lore details in there that we can pin from it. Whether or not he's exaggerating, he says, if I were forced to sing those same stupid songs every night for 20 years without ever getting a bath, I'd be pretty irritated too. So one, they stink, and two, this franchise might have been already existing for 20 years at this point, so possible pin there. They used to walk around during the day until the bite of 87, which took out someone's frontal lobe. Very big pin there, that's probably important, and also the bite of 87 is in the past tense, and he presumably dies at the end of the week right before we arrive, judging from the sound of his last phone call. Now, 
Point of order, we have to be careful with what this guy says, as several times in the phone calls he'll say something that sounds important or deadly, and then correct himself and say, oh, but legally, that's not the case. So it definitely seems like he's watching what he says because Fazbear Entertainment might fire him if he goes out of line or says too much truth that there is. Furthermore, his claim that they attack us because they think we're an endoskeleton is pretty flimsy at best. We're pretty sure that they're attacking us in the same way that they were killed in life, so we can pretty much disregard that reason right away. But it is interesting to note that supposedly this game takes place at least 20 years after the beginning of the franchise, and that the Bite of 87 took place during the day. And the fact that it was referred to as the Bite of 87, not that really bad bite a couple months ago, we can assume that this game doesn't take place in 1987 or before, so we can strike those years from the list of years we have prior. But also, because the franchise has been around for around 20 years, we can't go much past 1987. So our new list of possible years is 1992, 1998, and 2009. I know 2009 is past 2007, but it's close enough that the exaggeration of 20 years could be used there. So yeah, pins for all of those. As for other important details, the animatronics we see in this game are the main five. Freddy, Foxy, Bonnie, Chica, and Golden Freddy. The only other lore we could possibly gleam from this game is the appearance of Golden Freddy, who very rarely can show up on your screen with the accompanying text, It's Me. You can also get Golden Freddy's jump scare by inputting 1987 into the custom night mode. So this could imply that this yellow version of Freddy is the culprit, but for now, we will pin it. With all that settled, I think that's as much lore as we can get from FNAF 1, so let's move on to FNAF 2. Since this game is the beginning of Scott thinking about the game as a franchise, we get a lot more lore throughout this game specifically. So once again, let's start with the written lore first since it's the easiest to find. The game opens on this Help Wanted ad, which does mention that this is a grand reopening of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. So pin on that that the FNAF 2 location is not the first time this restaurant has been opened, but rather a reopening of a vintage pizzeria. The game ends on another newspaper clipping, this time with a lot of lore. After being open only a few short weeks, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is closing its doors. The new animatronics will be scrapped due to possible malfunctions, however, the original characters are being kept in hopes of a possible reorganization of the company. It's a minor setback, we are confident that we will reopen someday, even if it is with a much smaller budget. CEO Fazbear Entertainment. Also, the paycheck lists Jeremy Fitzgerald, November 13th, 1987, implying that one of the reasons the restaurant shut down is the bite of 87 we learned about in the first game. But we're not mixing our ingredients yet, so for now, pin that new Freddy Fazbear's Pizza closed down in 1987 due to unforeseen events. You get another paycheck to end this game, but it's dated the 12th, which is a Thursday, that's weird, but anyway, pin. Also, upon beating the custom night, you get a pink slip addressed to a Fritz Smith, separate from the person we play as in the main game. Once again, for tampering with the animatronics and odor, but this time with a note saying, on his first day, really? Pin there, that feels like it's important. Now that's the written lore. On the phone calls, there's a lot of audio, so here are some key points. The animatronics walk around during the day, have advanced mobility, and have a facial scanning feature that can scan for criminals and other kinds of predators to protect the children at the restaurant. We're the second guard for this position, and the other guard actually transitioned to the day shift right before we joined. The working theory that the phone guy presents for their aggression is that the animatronics were not given a night mode, so they wander the restaurant looking for noise or people because they think they can't find children. And then, once again, the theory is once they see you, they think you're an endoskeleton and try to shove you in a suit, which holds even less water with the facial scanning system, but whatever. The older models smell too much to be used, so they're kept in a side room and are used for parts. An investigation started going Going on that eventually closed the restaurant, someone tampered with the facial recognition software on the animatronics, the building goes into lockdown because of the investigation, especially to certain employees, and at the same time, the day shift opens up for us. The original restaurant of Freddy's was called Fredbear's Family Diner, but it closed a long time ago and they can't get a hold of the owner. And after somebody used a yellow suit that was stored in a back room, all of the animatronics started acting up. There's a lot here, so let's try to sum them up in a few pinnable lore details. How about the original restaurant, Fredbear's Family Diner, closed down years ago. The guy before us switched to the day shift after complaining about the animatronics' aggression. Then somebody tampered with their facial recognition software, somebody put on a yellow suit that was in a back room, and after that, all the animatronics started going haywire pin there, and there are four older models of Freddy, Chica, Bonnie, and Foxy in the back that are too smelly to be used, but are used for spare parts. 
pin. So before we start going into miscellaneous lore, there's actually two new categories we get to go into starting at FNAF 2, cutscenes and minigames and scottgames.com teasers. So let's go into cutscenes and minigames because there is a good amount of lore in these in FNAF 2. In Go Go Go, we see a purple guy in the corner and Foxy going to his show several times until eventually going to five corpses and ending in a jump scare. So a location with a pirate's cove had five kids die in it pin. In Take Cake to the Children, we see the same purple guy drive up outside of a restaurant and kill a child that was locked out. Pin. In Save Them, we see Withered Freddy being led around by the marionette in the FNAF 2 location. There are five corpses scattered around, all the while S-A-V-E-T-H-E-M is being said. At the very end, you see the text, you can't, and it ends. Pin. And finally, in Give Gifts, Give Life, we see the marionette give gifts to four corpses, then give a Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy mask to the same four corpses, with the child in the middle spawning a Golden Freddy jump scare. Pin. Whew, like I said, there's a lot of lore in those minigames, but there's also a cutscene in Between Nights that has some additional possible lore. In it, we see Freddy in what looks like the FNAF 1 location, looking back and forth, eventually Bonnie, then Chica look at you, and then finally, the marionette is staring at your face. So, that's weird. We'll put a pin in that for now. Going on to Scott Games' site teasers, most of the FNAF 2 ones just showcase new stuff. Not necessarily lore, but notably, something borrowed, something new could bolster the idea that some of the parts of the old animatronics were used to help make the toy animatronics. So, pin there. And also, this curtain seems to imply that there's a Pirate's Cove in the FNAF 2 location, but we never get to see it in-game. So, maybe there's a Pink Pirate's Cove? We'll put a pin in there. As for the animatronics in the game, we see Withered Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, and then we see Toy Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy, the Marionette, Mangle, and Balloon Boy. Occasionally, very rarely, you can see a Shadow Freddy on the monitors or a Shadow Bonnie in your room. Pins. That's all the lore I can think to collect in here, so let's move on to FNAF 3. As we've done, we'll start with the written lore, of which we only get two examples in newspaper clippings at the beginning and end of the game. Coming Soon just establishes that Fazbear Frights, the horror attraction, is a haunted house attraction in a theme park based around the stories surrounding the Fazbear franchise. So, pin, but at the end of the game, you get It Burns. Fazbear Frights burns to the ground. A new local attraction based on an ancient pizzeria chain burned down overnight. Authorities have not ruled out foul play, but at the moment, it seems to have been caused by faulty wiring. Very little was found at the scene. The few items that were salvaged will be sold at public auction. So this attraction burnt down and whatever was salvageable was sold in an auction. Pin. On the phone conversations, this time they're given through the perspective of two people. Phone Dude, the guy who owns the attraction, and pre-recorded messages from what sounds like our old phone guy from FNAF 1 and 2. There is a lot of audio here, but I'll go through some key points. Springtrap was located in a boarded up room at a Fazbear location. The tapes that teach us how to use Springlock suits are recorded for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. There were two suits designed to be Springlock suits, and while in animatronic mode, they're programmed to seek out the noise of children. Every restaurant always has a safe room that is not on the animatronic programming or in the security detail, effectively, digitally, completely hidden. An accident occurred at a sister location of multiple simultaneous Springlock lock failures. The company deemed the suits temporarily unsafe, so the classic suits are being retired in an appropriate location until they're fixed. In the meantime, a temporary costume was provided, but due to short notice, it isn't seen as relevant or appropriate for a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Management put out a reminder that one, customers should never be taken into a safe room, and that they noticed the Spring Bonnie suit had been used and reminded people that they are unsafe. And then, due to budget restrictions, all safe rooms are to be sealed up with everything that is inside to be left in there and effectively forgotten. There's a lot of lore here, but one of the things that immediately confuses me is it seems like the back rooms were sealed up a long time ago, but Springtrap is in them when they're sealed. I'm not sure. We'll go more into that when we're piecing together to the timeline, but for now, here are the pins that we can synthesize out of those details. Springlock suits were being used at at least a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and a sister location at the same time. But after an accident at that sister location, they were decommissioned and put in a safe room. Every Fazbear restaurant has a safe room that is effectively invisible to the animatronics and security system, but one day all of them were sealed up at the same time with everything left inside them. Someone was taking customers into the back room and using the yellow suit. 
Some irrelevant costume was given to customers to use after the spring locks were locked away. Yes, we learn about spring locks here, but we're not going into spring trap yet. We will get to him in a second. This second, in the mini games and cutscenes section. And this is where even more huge amounts of lore appear. There are two sets of mini games you see in FNAF 3. There are the ones you see every night, and then there's the ones that you only see when doing secret things in the environment. The in-between night mini games take place in a location that looks very similar to FNAF 1, especially the same in layout. Each one follows a different FNAF 1 animatronic being led to a back room they can't access by Shadow Freddy. Once they get there and then get confused trying to leave, a purple guy comes out of that room and decommissions them, pretty much breaks them into pieces, and the minigame ends. So big old pin there. There is one more notable event in these cutscenes. If you've done everything in the secret minigames, which we'll get to, the fifth one changes a bit. Now you're a spirit wandering through, you go into the back room and you meet several other spirits there, and the purple guy freaking out that he's surrounded by spirits. You chase him around a bit and then he goes into what looks like the old Spring Bonnie suit, but probably due to the moisture that's dripping on it, the springs contract, killing him instantly, and then the spirits presumably move on? They disappear. Yep, 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 that is almost 100% certainly Springtrap. So we can synthesize this entire cutscenes to a purple guy broke down the animatronics in a location that looks like the FNAF 1 area after it has been closed down, note boarded door, and then gets cornered in a back room, puts on a spring lock suit, and dies in there. As for the second set of minigames, they can be accessed by doing secret things in the environment with the clues given to us in the in-between night minigames. If done, we see different animatronics from the new Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, specifically Balloon Boy, Mangle, and Toy Chica. They then travel through different games based around them, Balloon Boy's Adventure, Mangle's Quest, and Chica's Party. If you sufficiently get out of bounds and break them, you then either retrieve a piece of cake or give cake to a crying child. If all of these are done correctly, eventually you get access to Stage 01. This one is much less of a game and isn't even titled as one. In it, we see what looks like a yellow Freddy and a yellow Bonnie performing on a stage for some children. If you escape the stage and do some shenanigans, you give out yet another piece of cake. The strangest one is next. R W Q F S F A S XC, where you're a purple glitched out Bonnie traveling through all the other minigames until eventually giving cake one last time. Finally, if all of these minigames are completed and you click this poster, you go to the Happiest Day minigame, where you are a small child with a puppet mask and eventually go to a side of the room with four children with a Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy mask, put a cake on the table, and the crying child stops crying, puts on a golden Freddy mask, or a lighter color, it's black and white, it's hard to tell. Then all the children disappear, their masks fall down, and their balloons fade up into the ceiling. Big. Old. Pin. Also, one last pin. If you do this correctly, at the very end, you see this screen with all the masks with their lights out. I don't think that's the canon ending. But regardless, there is an ending here where all the lights go out, possibly symbolizing the spirits have moved on. Pin. Still with me? I know, it's a lot. But let's move on to FNAF 4. First off, written lore. And, uh... There isn't any. As far as I can find, there is no written lore in this game, nor is there any audio transcripts. What we do get in lore in the form of this game is the gameplay, the Scott Games teasers, and especially the mini games. So let's start with gameplay. So throughout the nights, the area around your bedroom somewhat changes. New items appear, all of which imply the location of a hospital. We see some medication, an IV bag, flowers, etc. So someone went to the hospital, pin. And second, we see Nightmare Fredbear. Now, this is the first time we've seen anyone by the name of Fredbear since the mention of Fredbear's Family Diner in FNAF 2. Clearly, this Nightmare version is different, but it is worth noting that Fredbear is yellow. Also, whoever the protagonist of FNAF 4 is has seen Fredbear. Pin. Now, let's do some Scott Games teasers before we get into the real meat of the lore of FNAF 4. We get various pictures of the Nightmare animatronics with the text, Was it me? Was it me? Or me? And then this big guy with the text, or was it me? Probably, it's obscured, but that's most likely what it says. We also get this purple hat and a bow tie in the spotlight, the text, the final chapter, and the text, the end, thanks for playing. So nothing super pinnable here, but possibly the Nightmare Animatronics did something, pin, and this was intended to be the final chapter of the game series, pin. Okay, now we're talking about the big boy lore of these games the mini games. Now there's a lot of information in these, but I'm just going to go through some key details and we'll synthesize them into some pins as we go. There's a crying child who has an older brother and a seemingly a sister we never meet. His brother constantly bullies him for his fear of the Fazbear animatronics. 
He doesn't seem to fear the actual characters, as he has plushes in his room that he refers to as his friends. But according to the Fredbears that are strewn throughout the area, he saw something which made him not trust the animatronics. Eventually, due to a prank pulled by his older brother and his older brother's friends, he's put in the mouth of a Fredbear animatronic, is clamped down on, and dies. Presumably. Pin. The same voice that came from Fredbear talks to him while he's crying in the void. It promises to put him back together again and assures him that they're still his friends. Pin. The TV screen seems to imply that this game takes place in 1983, but that could just be the time the show aired. Regardless, Pin. This restaurant only seems to have a Fredbear and Yellow Bonnie suit, pointing to the fact that this could be the Fredbear's family diner we've heard about. But for now, Pin. These yellow suits are definitely seeming to be Springlock suits, as we see them worn and not worn throughout the cutscenes. Pin. I think that covers most of the lore for this game as well. So quick recap on some major finds we've plucked so far. Like I mentioned last week, William goes to prison. Or someone else does. Maybe it was Henry, that's why he wasn't there in the narrative so long. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Somebody went to prison. Also notably, there were some out-of-place costumes used immediately after the Springlock failures. And notably for me specifically, Springlock suits were used at multiple Fazbear locations at the same time. So let's move on to the next game. How long have we been going on for? Oh god. Okay, we're gonna have to stop here. Next week we'll tackle Sister Location to Ultimate Custom Night and try to get all the lore we can and squeeze them like a lemon. Remember, this is part one to a four-part miniseries, so if you're watching this in the future, just follow the playlist. But if you're watching it now, you gotta wait a week. Sorry, it's the first time I've done a multi-parter. And make sure to mark your calendars for December 30th when we release the definitive FNAF timeline uh, until Ultimate Custom Night. For now, if you're still confused, go ahead and check out the video I made explaining why I think there's two timelines. Shout out to the best patrons, The Toasted Slices, Emberisk, Zenith, Raven Eris, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chickpea, Isle, Lola Fembo, The Viper 26, James, and Loose Harriet. And until next time, as always, stay toasty, Slices.